Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 94 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Ann Shippey, and the topic of the show is environmental toxicity. Dr. Ann Shippey is a physician, scientist, engineer, and mom who works with science, clinical data, and research to provide the knowledge and tools needed to achieve optimal health. She is board certified in internal medicine and certified in functional medicine. She holds a doctorate in medicine from the University of Texas, a Master of Science in Engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. She uses cutting-edge science, innovative testing, research, and genetic information to determine and address the root causes of health issues, not to simply treat the symptoms of illness. She approaches each patient as a whole person and forms a therapeutic partnership to achieve the highest standard of health. Her approach to medicine is a unique blend of measured, precise data with a heartfelt and sympathetic attitude towards all of her patients. This method stems from her engineering background and her own failed experience as a patient of traditional medicine. She treats patients suffering from any combination of physical, environmental, or genetic issues. Her hope is to contribute to and inspire a positive movement towards solving some of the more complex health challenges we face today, and to help create a world where everyone has the opportunity for wellness. And now my interview with Dr. Ann Shippey. Today we are going to talk about environmental toxicity, detoxification, mold illness, and many other topics near and dear to my heart. I'm honored today to have Dr. Ann Shippey on the show to share her insights on these very important topics. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Shippey. Thanks for having me. You were a chemical engineer working at IBM, and later you became a doctor. So tell us how that happened. What was your your own personal health journey that kind of led you to doing the work you're doing today? How did you decide to leave your engineering work and become a doctor? And then building on that, what unique perspective does that engineering background give you as a practitioner today? So I loved engineering. I I worked for IBM and um, chemical engineering was a great use for my skills, you know, really problem solving, integrating information. And I thought I was going to retire from IBM. I, you know, I'd been there for 10 years and I loved the culture. I loved the people and I loved the work because I actually got to help get chemicals out of the manufacturing process, lead teams to do that. Um, but then I took a trip to Mexico and I was never the same again. So I went from doctor to doctor, had all kinds of studies done, and all they could do was band-aid my symptoms. Initially, they thought, well, you have a parasite, but um, treated that, didn't get better. Um, When they do the biopsies to look at my gut, I, I just had a lot of inflammation, and nobody took it another step further. And I'm like, I'm not gonna live this way. (laughs) And it was before the internet, so I, Um, I just started investigating everything that came across my path and reading all the books that I could read. So I went to a a naturopath. I went to an acupuncturist. I tried all kinds of different diets. I studied Ayurvedic approaches, um, tried supplements and nutritionists. I just, um, and then finally I got the pieces together so that then I was well again. And by that time, I was so fascinated with how the human body worked, and I knew that we could do medicine differently. It's just not okay to just band-aid symptoms because they're just going to continue to snowball and get worse. Um, So I woke up one morning and decided to go to medical school. (laughs) (laughs) I know. And I was very, very fortunate because I think a lot of people do get it, like get a calling to do something different at some point in their life, but they're so locked in to their life that they can't pursue their dream. And I was very, very fortunate that I, that I got to do that. And um, so I went to med school and had a baby in med school and then a baby in residency. And by the time I graduated, 
I was a little tired. <laughs> it was, you know, eight years of, <laughs> of, um, of uh, pretty hard work. And then also kind of taking a toll on my body, being pregnant and um, nursing and all of that with all the high stress. So I, I took a little break from my dream and I just did internal medicine. Uh, and then about three years into it, I developed a couple of autoimmune disorders. Mm-hmm. And that was like, oh, oh, I better get back on my path. Yeah. <laughs> I can't just be doing the medicine that I, I know is a really helpful foundation. There's a, a place for it. I use it every day. But that I needed to have the extra tools in my toolbox to add on. And that's when I found the functional medicine training. And that, at that point, it was so obscure. You know, now it's uh, much easier to find the approaches with functional medicine where we're really looking at how all the systems fit together and um, looking for the root cause, I was able to recover from my autoimmune disorders. Beautiful. So functional medicine is really kind of being a medical detective in a way, you know, in the work you do with people with serious chronic illnesses that haven't been solved with more conventional methods. I'm curious, what are some of the common puzzle pieces or contributors to their poor state of health? What are the root causes of disease that you see in your patient population? Yeah, and usually there's more than one thing going on. You know, there's not just a silver bullet. <laughs> there's a uh, there's often nutritional deficiencies so that the biochemistry and physiology isn't running properly. Like one of the most common ones is almost everybody's depleted in magnesium. And I think we're probably having an increased utilization and then it's just not present in our food uh, at the levels that we need it to be now. And then, uh, uh, a lot of times there's, you know, a p- genetic uh, SNP, a little uh, predisposition to having some weaker spots on our body. So if we can find what those are and, and find workarounds, that's really helpful. But the biggest thing that I see today is environmental toxicity, which can do direct damage to cell membranes, to mitochondria, to DNA, um, as well as really suppress our immune systems so that then we have uh, infections that are just going awry. And, you know, what's really fascinating is we're seeing a lot of this in the, um, in the animal population as well. And the, um, and the insects and the snakes are there in the bats. Like when, <laughs> so we see these common themes with all these organisms on the planet, including humans getting these suppressed immune systems. And my belief is that our environment is, um, you know, it's, our earth is like a bathtub. We keep putting toxins in and we're just running out of room for, um, for being able to clean it up appropriately. I'm 100% in resonance with everything that you're saying so far. I think environmental toxicity is the biggest player in a lot of these conditions that we see, whether it's Lyme or mold or chronic fatigue or MS or many of these different conditions. You mentioned the genetic side of it. Let's talk for a little bit about genetics versus epigenetics. So many people, we talk about SNP testing, which really represents potential, not function. And I know people sometimes will do genetic testing and then they kind of lose hope and they say, well, I'm broken and I just can't get better. What are your thoughts on that? How important are the genes versus those epigenetic influencers of our gene expression? Well, I I have a couple of examples. So, you know, one is celiac disease. So, you know, celiac disease is when you eat gluten and your gut starts to die, you know, and create lots of inflammation. Well, there's a whole spectrum with that. So, um, you know, some people can actually have a celiac gene, but get to the end of their life and never have a true celiac true celiac diagnosis and then other people are born with it and a lot of that I get I think actually goes back to environmental exposures you know nutritional status and whether they're being exposed to toxins another example that I really love um, even about how we can influence it is um, a young uh, a young man he was about 12 when I saw him he had a diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome so that's actually one of those genetic disorders that's, you know, it's, it's very, very challenging and difficult to live with because their, their ligaments are very loose and just, you know, some people can just jump off a step and displace their patella. And that was actually what was happening with this, um, with this boy. And, um, you know, it took a lot of work on the mom's part to actually get to a doctor and figure out a diagnosis, first of all. But then when they came to see me, we just started looking at what was going on with him, you know, what his nutritional status was, 
um, you know, how well he was methylating, uh, what his environmental exposures were. And what we found was that by really, really minimizing the environmental exposures, so some things that she thought were actually good for him were probably uh, causing some problems. Like she thought, okay, well, we, we, we need to eat a lot of fish and, you know, we need to keep things really clean. So we're going to you know, use a lot of cleaners. And once we started taking out those environmental toxins and really building his system, getting the um, amino acids and the fatty acids in the right uh, proportion, when he went back to some of those same doctors that diagnosed him, they're like, well, we don't really even see it anymore. Wow. You know, it's, it, you know, I'm sure he, sure he still had some laxity. He was still on that spectrum of laxity, but he wasn't that full blown where, you know, you lean on your face and your vessels start to, your blood vessels start to break or you, you know, easily get, um, you know, bleeding blood vessels in your eye or, uh, you can actually jump off a step or do marching right. band, things like that. So I thought that story because it really taught me so much because when I started seeing him, I didn't know how much we were going to be able to impact his quality of life. But we, you know, over a nine month period, we were able to see dramatic change in how his genes were expressing themselves. So the epigenetics are so powerful. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great example of that. People think a lot about how we get toxins out of the body, but we often don't talk about minimizing their introduction in the first place. So, so what are some of the things that we can do in our environment, in our daily life to minimize those exposures in the first place? So some of the simple things are having a, the best water filter that you can can have. So just depending on what your situation is, you um, you know, if you are in your home and you have the resources, get a whole house water filter, the best one that you can afford, so that every bit of water that you use has the toxins taking it out of it. Because it's that's one of the biggest sources that I'm seeing. Um, I had a patient yesterday who we looked at her um, toxin levels and they were some of the highest I've ever seen. And so uh, the first thing I asked her was, well, what kind of water do you have? And they were on well water and they only had a softener on it, you know, was another thing that really showed me the importance of the water. So if you can't do the whole house, at least do the water that you're cooking with and, um, and drinking. I think it's really helpful to run a HEPA filter at night so that the air that you're breathing is good. And then also having the, the healthiest mattress that you can. So a lot of the mattresses, and I know this is a big investment for some people, but certainly if you have the opportunity to get a natural mattress, a lot of these um, mattress toppers and uh, um, other commercial mattresses are outgassing as you sleep in through your lungs and in through your skin. Um, the other thing is buying organic food as much as you can. So I know that that's been such a controversial topic. There are studies that have been done, done on it and some are for it, some are against it. But what I see in my practice is that when we get people eating as organic as possible, we really see the environmental toxins coming down. And those are just simple things that we can do every day. And then I try to not put anything on my skin or hair that I wouldn't eat because <laughs> it's going right in. And then fragrances are a huge thing. The number of people that have the, um, the fragrances hanging in, in their cars, stop that. <laughs> it's going right in through your skin and in through your lungs. It's like you're smoking. Yeah, Absolutely. When we look at detoxification, we hear about the importance of detoxification quite a lot these days. I think people are starting to really understand that it is important. When you have a patient that comes to you and you start in exploring this environmental toxicity, what are some of the toxins you're looking for? What are some of the lab tests that you perform to try to get some insights around that? Yeah, so it's... We, we're still pretty limited as to what we can test for, um, although it's, you know, continuing to really increase. So depending on what the situation is and depending on what the person's budget is, um, there are a lot of things that we can do that give us some clues. Um, sometimes heavy metal testing, a lot of the pesticides, the volatile organic compounds like I was just talking about, um, the mycotoxins. Um, you know, sometimes there are even just some simple signs in the labs, like liver enzymes being towards the upper end of normal, um, like a GGT, ALT, or AST, that also kind of give, give us that clue uh, as to what's going on. 
Talk to us a little about glyphosate. That's another common conversation these days. So what kinds of tests can we do for glyphosate? What patterns do you see in your patients that maybe you're dealing with glyphosate toxicity? And then how do we support the body in removing glyphosate and related pesticides? Uh, so glyphosate, I think we've really, we've really done a disservice to our planet because even people like me that we've been eating organic for years and we're pretty careful about what we eat. Um, everybody that I test has at least some glyphosate coming out through their urine. Um, and then some people more than others, especially if they're living in a, in a state where there's a lot of agriculture. Um, it's, you know, they're uh, crop dusting and, you know, it's just getting into the water and the air. It's really ubiquitous. And what's really unfortunate it is that, you know, we're having these chemicals and pesticides being released in tons and tons a year um, without fully having evaluated them. So every time I go on to PubMed to see what the latest is on glyphosate, there's numerous new studies looking out. And one of the biggest concerns about the glyphosate is the amount of hormone disruption that's happening. So, you know, the hormones are really a broad category. It's not just estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, but all the uh, um, main chemical messengers in our body can be disrupted by the glyphosate. And there's such a link with even, you know, when there's, they don't do these studies on humans, of course, but um, on the, the fish and insects and that kind of thing, they're seeing implications for multiple generations. So, you know, this generation gets an exposure and then that actually impacts the health of future generations. So I think we have a major problem on our hands for, for, um, for what's, what we're, all the uh, true understanding of how serious uh, glyphosate is going to be, including disrupting our microbiome. So, the, you know, the gut mucosa is getting so disrupted. And I think that's also, you know, we're seeing links with um, autism and, um, and, you know, inflammatory bowel disease and all kinds of things that we're also seeing on an uptick. And I think it's going to take decades to really uncover what the full effects are. So as far as getting it out of our body, of course, back to your initial point, which is such a good one is avoiding what we can, like, um, it, it kind of shocks me sometimes that I have these really smart patients that sometimes just don't make the connection. So I had a patient a few years ago who, you know, had some poison ivy and some weeds in her yard, brilliant woman. And she went out and sprayed with glyphosate herself with no protection on. And she was sick for several months, um, hormone disruption, skin rashes, uh, gut issues. Like she, like almost every system in her body was affected by just going out and spraying, um, spraying the weed. So please make the connection with the things that, um, that you do that maybe you've done for years or that your parents did that, you, you know, you might not think about, Oh my gosh, I've got to get exposed when I do this. Um, to avoid it. And then second of all, I think that um, from what I'm seeing, the liposomal glutathione is really helpful with the glyphosate. And then, and then um, the binders like the charcoal protein or uh, um, modified citrus pectin and the, the uh, clean clays. Stephanie Seneff has talked recently about the possibility that uh, glyphosate may be replacing glycine in our proteins. And so I'm curious, do you potentially find that supplemental glycine is a, a good thing in that scenario? I think it's a good thing in that scenario and many others. Um, it's like, it's one of those supplements and things that we can put in our body that are essentially no risk. There is no downside to having a little bit too much glycine that I know of. So the other thing that glycine does is it actually helps to detoxify. Mm -hmm. And then it also um, crosses the blood brain barrier and is calming and relaxing. So it's very, very helpful at um, pretty high doses, like five grams a day to help with things like um, anxiety, insomnia, and OCD. That's excellent. 
Let's talk a little bit before we move on to talking about mold, which we're going to talk about for quite a bit of the rest of the discussion. Um, if we're talking about detoxification, heavy metals are certainly a conversation that we want to touch on as well. So in terms of your patients, the symptoms they have, how much of a role do you think heavy metals play? Um, when do you explore that specifically? Do you do chelation? Do you do other detoxification type support interventions? What are your thoughts on heavy metals? That's such a great question. When I look at the people that seem to be most predisposed to getting sick from mold, a lot of times their uh, detoxification pathways like the CYP1B1 and uh, ability to make glutathione are, are impacted. And so that makes them more susceptible to heavy metals as well. So what I see a lot of times is that the people that are getting sick from mold, their barrels just filled up and mold just happens to be the last straw. And so as we're helping the body to recover from mold, a lot of times we're helping the, the metals to get out as well by supporting those same pathways. So it depends on the patient and what their budget is, because I kind of know I'm going to work on that anyway. But if we're looking for, um, you know, assessing our progress in addition to how they're feeling, I, if, if we can if it's uh, in the budget, I also like to look at the heavy metals and I do things like um, DMSA challenge mm -hmm. to look for um, mercury and then the other things that are have the most affinity for DM, uh, or DMPS and then DMSA for, the, um, for lead and some of those other things. But a lot of times there are, are some, some metals in these patients as well and that um, – by uh, supporting the liver, supporting the glutathione, supporting um, the phase one detoxification, they're coming out as well. I'm not a proponent of IV chelation. Um, I really have found that for most patients, we can do the job gently and uh, safely uh, with just using supplements and things like hyperbaric and infrared sauna very carefully. It's kind of like opening up the, the spigots all at the right time <laughs> so that there's not too much turbulence in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody has any increased symptoms in anything going on, then we step back and we tweak what we're doing because they should actually feel the same or better to, to show me that they're detoxifying safely. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think the heavy metals doing it gently long term. I mean, I think we need to detoxify daily and for the rest of our life if we want to be healthy on this planet. Um, and I do think a lot of times people try more aggressive heavy metal detoxification approaches. Sometimes it actually exacerbates their symptoms. And in all the people that I've talked to over the years, I can't really think of too many, if any people that had a significant chronic illness that that recovered and said, oh, the reason that I got better was because I detoxified heavy metals. It's a piece of the puzzle, but it doesn't generally seem to be the only one or even the primary one. I, I That's totally been my experience. In fact, I've had a number of patients over the years that ended up coming to me because they got worse with someone trying to, to chelate them. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about mold. This is such a big topic these days. So when you're talking first to a patient, um, besides the do you have mold in your house question, which of course everyone says no, what are some of the questions that you ask to kind of probe into this area to get a sense for whether that might be an issue? And then what are some examples of places in the home where uh, mold could be an issue that we don't even think about? How common is it that someone has mold in their living environment? Unfortunately, I think it's an epidemic. I think uh, with the way that buildings are being built since the, since the 70s, with, um, with working on uh, the lower energy, you know, we're sealing up the homes more, they're not breathing, and then we've had all these heavy rains almost everywhere in the country, which is like a stress test for our houses. If there's a, a, a barrier that's not done perfectly, the water's going to get in. Um, so the way that I like to work with my patients is I listen as much as I can for the first 20 to 40 minutes that, that I'm sitting down with them. And I usually, a new patient visits usually around two hours. And a lot of times there's something in the story that helps me to start to think, think about mold. So it might be that they're having some weird neurological symptoms or changes in their depth perception or um, 
um, uh, muscle cramps. So there's, there's these common themes that don't quite fit with other things quite as well. And there's usually some type of collection. Another thing would be just a really major uptick in anxiety or OCD um, because a lot of these mycotoxins really uh, inter start to interfere with the neurotransmitters. Um, you know, more and more, I think because I'm talking about mold so much, people are, they come in and they're like, yeah, I think I've got mold. <laughs> um, but then as far as, um, you know, trying to figure out, is it in their home? Is it the work, their school, their car? Um, we just, we just talk about, it. I just had a patient with, um, who lives in Houston, you know, which has had all these major water issues in the last few years. Um, they had had a leak that they'd just kind of been ignoring. It wasn't a big leak, but, a, you know, just a little discoloration in the ceiling. So I just start to ask for, is there any signs or any history? Because a lot of people think, oh, if the, you know, if the toilet overflowed and it dried up, it's fine. Not realizing that they really only have 24 to 48 hours to get things dried or there's likely going to be some mold behind the, the um, behind the wall and then there's just these little insidious things like whether the windows were installed properly the flashing's not done perfectly um that gets wet a little water gets in and then gradually over time every uh, every time it rains a little bit more mold happens but it's not enough to get through the paint um showers being in installed improperly that's such a huge one and that's it's that's so difficult to detect um, and to, unless you actually do a testing. And then a lot of times these appliances can have little little leaks behind them, the dishwasher, the refrigerator, uh, water line, um, washer dryer. So um, it, unless there's been something obvious, we really have to do the test on the, the patient, the building, and, um, and then sometimes even, you know, get an inspector in to really look for the subtle subtle details. So I think that's so important when people are engaging help to, you know, they're suspicious um, to, to get somebody to come out and test and to inspect to get a sense that there is going to be a person who's really meticulous, you know, that they're going to pull the dishwasher out, that they're going to, um, you know, go up in the attic and look at every nook and cranny, that they might open up some um, walls and put a, a, a scope, a camera in to, to look and see what's going on and really take adequate dust samples. And I've also noticed that front loading washing machines can be a big source of mold. That was an issue for me and I had other mold illness three different times, but um, most recently one of the exposures was to a front loading washing machine that every time I would run it, you could smell that musty smell um, in the upper level of the house. <laughs> and, and you can't, you really cannot clean it. Like yeah. there's no way to clean it. You just have to get rid of it and get a top loader. Which is exactly what I did. <laughs> and then even with the top loaders, you need to open the lid and open the soap dispenser so that it dries out between uses. Absolutely. Now remind me, am I remembering correctly that in your personal journey, there was a mold component to your autoimmune conditions and your own recovery? Yes. I've had multiple run-ins run with mold too. Okay. <laughs> And I think part of it really just is the challenge with uh, with construction these days. It's uh, I think we're going to over the next five to ten years we're going to have to change the way we construct buildings again, but um, and designing conditioning systems and all that kind of thing. But yeah, the first time I I had just gone to Bill Ray's uh, workshop about nine months before and heard about toxic mold for the first time because we're we're not taught about it in in um, med school or residency, I was like, hmm, okay, I've been missing this in a couple of my patients. I actually had one of those patients that had the, uh, all the windows in her two-year-old house had had leaked enough that there was hidden mold behind them. So it's like, oh, this is cool. I can, I can help people. And um, the timing was just amazing because I started to have some health symptoms. I was getting a lot of pain in my body. My hair was falling out. I was exhausted on on Monday mornings instead of refreshed. Um, I couldn't wear my heels because my uh, an old fracture in my foot was aching after twenty years, and um, my right arm got so weak that I 
uh, if I had a full glass of water, sometimes it would slip out of my hands and carrying my, you know, picking up my purse was hard. So wow. really scared. Well, I, um, and a lot of times it is that pain and struggle that we experience that then becomes our passion and, and really helps us to help other people. So it sounds like that's certainly been your journey. Uh, very, I'm so, very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful because now not only can I, I, I learned so much just by what it took for me to get well, because, um, you know, Coley styrene mean, just made me sicker. And that was the, kind of the one thing that was out there in the conversation at the time. Right. I'm so grateful because I learned not only how to help my patients more and how to recognize it, but that truly you can be feeling like you are dying, like you're going to be dead or disabled and totally recover. Absolutely agree. So if someone uh, has the potential for mold in their living environment, do you recommend any initial testing before they bring an IEP or indoor environmental professional in? Do you find the ERMI hurts me too type testing helpful? What do you recommend to patients? I, this is such a, a hot topic, right? Cause we're all a little different in how we think about it, but uh, the ERMI test can be so deceiving you can have a low score on the ERMI scale, but still have a mold that's like kryptonite for Superman in there and it doesn't show up on there. So if I have somebody do the ERMI testing, I have them not look at the scale. We have to go back and we have to look and see what's there. Um, there's a test called an HC45 uh, that does a few more uh, molds than what the, the ERMI test does. So I've been using that. So that's a you know test, not a... Um, an air uh, collection, which I found is almost always worthless. Every, every once in a while, it's helpful, but I don't think it's worth spending the money on. And then the hurts me too. If I had followed that, I'd, I'd still be disabled because it would have said, oh yeah, it's fine for you to stay in this house. And it, it, it was so neurotoxic for me. So I, I think that's a really, really confusing metric for people. Um, and then I do what I find, I feel like it's a Venn diagram. You know, we can't test for every mold and some molds, if you don't get right by it, you're going to miss it. Um, so you want to do that plus do the mycotoxin test. And look, if there's anything that's positive that looks suspicious, then you've got to dig deeper. So the HC45 test, what lab offers that testing? That is through Amtech, and the way to order the wipes is through blackmoldscan.com. They're in the process of getting it automated, so right now it's kind of going to a website and, and sending an email, but okay. they're, they're going to be uh, working on getting that more explanatory. And um, so with that HC45, you can also add on the mycotoxin test for, um, for at least three of the categories, the trichothecene, the ochratoxin, and the uh, aflatoxin. And that's a mycotoxin test of the environmental sample as well, or mm -hmm. is that the, the urinary mycotoxin? Test? That is of the dust. Okay, beautiful. So that same wipe that you go and get as much dust as you can, you yep. can run both both tests. Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's a new one for me, so thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, do you find that your patients generally can remediate and be successful and healthy again living in a specific environment or do you find that they need to generally move and if they do need to move what kind of testing do you recommend before they commit to moving to a new environment that's such a great question because that really is the critical link to getting better so just my experience is if the if the mold was chitomium and the patient has neuro neurological symptoms i haven't had anybody be able to remediate uh, I think that particular mold, it, it uh, grows with hooks on it. And uh, it's just, I think it, it just doesn't uh, clean up from the environment the way some of the other um, molds and um, mycotoxins do. So, and then some of it depends on uh, the building itself. So if there's a basement or a crawl space, a pier and beam, built into the side of the hill, those particular types of buildings are very, very difficult to get uh, clean enough, especially if somebody's been pretty ill. So we talk about those things and, you know, kind of weigh the risks. It and sometimes it depends on how much they love their house, what their resources are. Um, 
before they even try. But it is, especially if somebody's very sick, it's it can be tricky. Sometimes if people can um, get away for a few months to a dry, cleaner environment, um, they can do enough healing and then move back into a remediated house and do much better. And uh, so I'm in Austin, Texas, and it's very humid here, and we don't have great buildings. So uh, if somebody loves their house and we think it can be remediated, sometimes that time away will give them a better shot at being able to move back in and not get sick again. People probably wondered earlier why you mentioned bats when you mentioned the animals. But since you are from Austin, Texas, I know there's that bridge down there where the bats come flying out. And we love our bats because <laughs> they eat the mosquitoes. <laughs> a lot of times people will find a very small um, mold maybe in their bathroom and they'll say, okay, great, I'm going to get some Clorox and clean that up. Why is that not such a great idea and what products might you recommend for small issues like that? So Clorox is pretty toxic. And it doesn't really kill the mold very well. And a lot of times if there is um, a recurring mold problem, it's just a sign that there's something behind the, the, the shower, the tile. Um, so a lot of times you, uh, it's just kind of futile and you're not getting rid of the, the mold production that's behind the walls. Um, I really, a lot of the things that are, being sold to eliminate mold, the foggers and the, all the chemicals, I feel are can be just as damaging and really fill people's barrels up as badly as the the mycotoxins. So the, the best thing is to just get it out of there, completely get it out of there. And if someone is then moving to a new environment, do you recommend they do that HC45 test before they commit to a lease or a purchase or... <sighs> Absolutely, because it's heartbreaking when you've gone through all the work to get rid of things and get a few new things like a new mattress or and clothing for some people that are really sick need to do that. And then they move into a place that may be just as bad or worse. Um, uh, so I know it's an investment to do the testing, but when you look at the time and the energy and the resources that you're putting into moving into a place, and then especially if you're buying or leasing, um, it, it just gets so expensive if you don't test first. Are there specific brands of air filtration devices that you recommend for your patients to install in their homes? The, um, the one that I personally have experience with is a Munter's unit. Um, it's very challenging to maintain. I have to have uh, somebody come, a company come from uh, like 90 miles away to come and service it and changing the filters is difficult, but it, it has really, really helped me to keep humidity low and to do some, some filtration. Um, so what I normally do for patients is recommend, uh, an expert in this area, uh, and have them work with that particular building rather than just going with a particular brand. But it, it can really help to lower humidity and to, um, to have uh, the HEPA filter kind of thing or even an air scrubber. When I, uh, the first time I got really sick from mold, I ran a couple air scrubbers, like, you know, the big, blue, ugly, loud <laughs> things for a couple of years just to really make sure I had the best clean air that I could. I would turn it down when we were there. Um, but then when we were gone, I turned it on high so that when we got home, the air was as clean as possible. People that are reactive to their car from a mold exposure, do you find there's any real solutions there or is the solution to get a new car? Unfortunately, it's got a new car, but really air it out because most cars outgas so much and those chemicals aren't good either. So right. every time you get into a new car, you need to unroll the windows. And, um, and then I use something called echo bags that are silica to help absorb some of the toxins from the new car. But uh, yeah, having, I had a car that, um, that got, got moldy and, uh, um, they, you know, they kept trying to fix it and they actually ended up um, buying it back with the, with the lemon law. So um, if, if you have a new car, you know, less than a year old and you suspect that it's moldy, you know, take it up with the manufacturer. How is mold allergy different from mold toxicity or biotoxin illness in terms of the symptoms, how you might approach treatment? Um, I think a lot of times people think that they're, they're similar or the same when in reality they're very different, right? 
They're extremely different. Um, so allergy can be a serious illness, right? That's uh, people are pretty miserable when their nose is running, sinus congestion. And with asthma, that can be life threatening um, because that's, you know, the, basically the lungs going into spasms and people die from that all the time. Um, especially when people have new onset asthma, they need to think about where as mold is an exposure because mold is actually one of the most common causes of of uh, adult onset asthma, and it's probably in children too. It's just not uh, the statistics aren't aren't as clear. So, um, with the allergy and asthma, usually all you have to do is remove the problem. You know, you just get out of the immediate uh, environment and uh, minimize additional exposures for a while, and those symptoms will settle down. Mm -hmm. The um, with the toxin side of things, it's really more like getting poisoned. So it's the chemicals that the molds are making, wreaking havoc in the body, you know, messing with neurotransmitters, poisoning the cell membranes and the mitochondria, actually even sitting on the DNA. So one of the tests that I do on patients that can afford it, it's a very expensive test. We have to send it off to Germany, but we can see what environmental toxins are sitting on DNA, specific genes. And um, you know, sometimes I see the the mold toxins are, are that are actually causing those problems. And the beauty of this test is that then we can um, do the follow up to see that what the uh, actions that we've taken have cleaned up the DNA, so that those the DNA isn't being impacted in, in the epigenetics and gene expression anymore. What what lab is it that does that test? It's called IGL, and it's okay. uh, they're very. It's um, it's a lab that it's it's hard to get into. Like you yeah. kind of have to know the right people to be able to send them samples at this point because it's a fairly young lab and they have limited capacity. Okay. But um, I'm really hoping that uh, we get a lab in the United States. Partly so, hopefully, it'll become more affordable because we you know sending things over to Germany is expensive, but um, for me, kind of being the uh, the chemical engineer, loving to look at the latest technology and seeing how we can, you know, put more of the puzzle pieces together, it's really been um, helpful in really trusting what I'm seeing and the concepts and and how significant some of these um, chemicals and metals and and mycotoxins are as far as the impacts on the on the body. One of the things that I've observed with the allergy versus biotoxin illness um, discussion is that if somebody's in their home and they leave and fairly quickly they feel better and, and they're not on any binders or anything to deal with that biotoxicity, that to me sounds like kind of more of the allergy person, right? They left the exposure, they immediately feel better. Usually if it's the biotoxin illness, just because you leave the environment for a couple of days, you may not notice a huge difference unless you're also working on getting those mycotoxins out of the body. Does that, does that seem correct? Um, I, I think there are a couple of other scenarios too. Yeah. So, so sometimes people actually have decent detoxification pathways, <laughs> you know, that aren't compromised by the exposures and, you know, they're more right at the tipping point. They weren't more like I was where I was, you know, my barrel was so over, you know, over flooded. Um, so it could be just that it is the mycotoxins, but getting a little bit of relief and their body's like, oh, okay, I got this. And they're, you know, doing better. Um, but there is that, even with the mycotoxins, there's the, the immune system response to the mycotoxins. You know, the, the immune system's trying to help to clear the toxins, to know what to deal with them. So um, I kind of think about that as a little bit different than the allergy symptoms, you know, that's more of like the inflammatory response. So some people um, like me have this kind of hyper alert immune system and it takes a little bit for things <laughs> to start settling down. Mm -hmm. And then other people are like, okay, their immune system is like, okay, danger's gone. I'm, I'm chill. <laughs> so it, it's very, very complex and such an interesting topic. And, you know, to, there are some 
uh, labs, you know, some of the shoemaker labs are where we can look at the uh, TGF beta one and the C3A and C4A um, and some of the other hormone mediators and, and get some ideas about um, how the current environment is and whether there was a re-exposure and all that kind of thing. But I have heard you talk about recurrent yeast infections in those people with mold illness as well. And that's something that I've seen and observed and talked with other practitioners about, but I don't think it's discussed all that much. So what's the connection between living in a moldy home and potentially having ongoing issues with yeast or candida? Um, what's the connection there? So a lot of the animal studies show that uh, certain mycotoxins suppress the immune system. So what they see in animals that are being exposed is that they get all kinds of illnesses, um, you know, infections. So I think the same thing is happening with humans where the mycotoxins uh, cause immune suppression so that the microbiome gets out of balance. So, of course, we have good viruses, bacteria, yeast, and probably even parasites uh, that are actually helping us to be healthy. So then when the immune system gets suppressed, then the microbiome becomes party. And some of the things that if we had, you know, a little bit of candida, that would be normal. But when the immune system gets suppressed, it goes uh, high. Then there's the, the actual mold infection. So we should never have aspergillus growing in us. That should just not be there. Um, and so um, what's probably usually happening when we're not exposed to mold or immunosuppressed for another reason are microbiome and our immune system would just quelt it. It'd be, you know, just get rid of it. Um, but in the mold, what I've seen over and over again is that people are more likely to have the mold, you know, some types of mold or other fungus um, growing in their sinuses and their lungs and their gut and on their skin. And a lot of times, if we don't also address that, it's, it's much more difficult for them to recover because their immune system's just really taken up with trying to to not to get in, totally invaded by that um, that infection. And even if those people then leave an environment where they had this exposure that might have led to a colonization and their new environment is perfectly clean, if they still have that colonization, they're still producing more mycotoxins and other uh, mold toxins internally within the body, correct? That is so correct. Yeah, I've seen that in patients over and over again. We talked a little about mycotoxins. That is one of the key issues, but there are other things that we get exposed to with these molds as well. Um, maybe if we focus more on the mycotoxin side of it for now, how do you measure mycotoxins? Do you use the urinary mycotoxin testing? How helpful has that been for your patients? Yeah, I found it to be extremely helpful, but not extremely accurate. So um, uh, I'll tell you a story. So one patient that uh, that came in, he was a 16-year-old boy, and he had severe facial contortion. His muscles in his face were, uh, like when I first saw him, I almost gasped because I just was not uh, expecting to see his face so distorted. And when we got into his history, he was, his um, family was living in an old, a really cool old, like, you know, 100-year-old farmhouse. And so the warning bells were going off. Okay, I think he's, um, I think he's in mold. And so we did the urine test, and it was zero, completely clean, not even a speck of mycotoxin. I was like, hmm, okay, well, let's get his genetics. And so we did a panel, a detox gene panel, that one of the genes uh, that we looked at had to do with glutathione. And he had sniffs, so little glitches in every one of his glutathione genes that we tested. So this poor young man was not making any glutathione or very little glutathione to clear out the toxins. So this is when I first discovered that with, um, with the real-time lab test, for me to really get an accurate look at what had built up in the body, not just what was coming out, I needed to give some glutathione. So I was like, okay, well, what's kind of the bigger dose of glutathione that I can give and consulted with um, Redisor glutathione. He said, okay, you can do, you know, the maximum I've ever given was eight teaspoons. So I gave him eight teaspoons of glutathione and collected the urine again. He had a ton of, of all of the mycotoxins that we tested for. And um, so we put him on some glutathione, uh, sent him to his grandparents out of the state, <laughs> 
and he got better. There is some debate with these urine mycotoxin tests in terms of whether or not the mycotoxins are from environmental exposure, whether they're from food exposure. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think the food contributor is significant? Do you think it's probably not the key issue? I think for aflatoxin it, and, and a person's eating nuts and grains, it's probably the food. But the trichothesines and the ochratoxin, I think it's less likely, although sometimes we can have people you know, not eat the most likely uh, foods, so coffee, chocolate, grains, um, nuts. We can have them stay off of that and recheck it, check it and see if the numbers change. But most of the time, uh, the mycotoxin test correlates with what's in the um, in home or work, school, car environment pretty well or what we end up finding. Um, Great Plains is a you know, they're newer on the scene with their mycotoxin test, and they've actually done an amazing job of adding additional mycotoxins to their test. So I'm actually with some patients that are super sick and we're just really wondering what's going on. I'll actually run um, real-time and Great Plains and run the real-time with no glutathione and with glutathione. Uh, you can't use glutathione with the um, Great Plains lab because... Uh, the glutathione will change the conformation of the, the toxin enough that it can, it'll miss it. Um, uh, it's you know, and, that, and that's interesting too, because I know I've had conversation with Dr. Neil Nathan about that. And even with Great Plains, he does still, at least last time I talked with him, does still recommend using glutathione, even though I know the lab has suggested that may be a, a potential issue. I, I actually, like if, if the tests are, you know, if the finances aren't an issue, it's interesting to do both with both labs. I know with real time, I need to do both to get an accurate picture. Um, with the Great Plains, I haven't played around with it as much. And then some people will use the saunas or hyperbaric, to, you know, to kind of boost the excretion from the tissues um, before doing the testing. So where I've come to with this is if the test is negative, it doesn't rule it out. Right. If you get some, you know it's coming from somewhere and you have to figure it out. People think of mycotoxins as the core issue, but there are also these VOCs or MVOCs. There's other bacteria in environments that are water damaged. When we smell that musty kind of smell, is that more likely from the MVOCs than from the mycotoxins? Yes, that's the MVOC. So there's the, are, are the chemicals that I kind of compared to like sniffing glue. <laughs> you know, it's going right into your brain right. um, and, and, and can definitely cause um, some psychological effects. Many people listening to this show are dealing with chronic infections like Lyme disease, co-infections. Do you find that when someone has mold illness that that dysregulation of the immune system can then allow things like Lyme disease to become a bigger issue where maybe before the immune system was managing it relatively well? That's exactly what I'm seeing. So I've now seen quite a few people that have Lyme present that when we deal with the mold, the Lyme's no longer an issue. And I compare it to kind of like shingles. So with shingles, we've got the chickenpox virus that's there, but kind of dormant in a nerve. And then when the immune system gets suppressed, then it can come out to play and cause the pain and the rashes and things in the nerves. So I really think that that's a lot of what's happening with these chronic illnesses is um, it's just the immune system not being able to work and being in balance. So... Because Lyme, Lyme is so difficult to get get actually rid of. You know, it's so hard on the microbiome with all the different types of treatments. That I think it's at least worthwhile trying to see if you can get it in check by dealing with the environmental toxins like mold first. So let's talk a little about the key steps that you take someone through from a recovery perspective from mold illness. And, and really, my assumption is that many environmental toxins are benefiting from this treatment protocol. It's not specific to mold toxicity per se, but metals and chemicals and pesticides and so on. So would you agree that kind of this framework that you have in place is really helping people on, on multiple different types of environmental toxins? Exactly. It's just lowering the overall um, toxin load so that so then there's some leeway in the barrel <laughs> you know so hopefully if we if we go you know stay in a place where we get a little exposure we don't get sick again that, um, like we do initially when we're recovering that um that we have some resiliency so yeah so it's um 
we've got to open up the detoxification spigots. And I really think that it's, you know, working with each person, kind of knowing what the possible spigots are to see what works best for them. So I love the liposomal glutathione, the binders like charcoal, clay, and pectisol, um, uh, the, the liver support, looking at methylation, you know, do you need the methylated folic acid and the other things that help the methylation process to work smoothly. Um, but the number one thing is really getting into as clean of an environment as possible, not just the cleanest from mold standpoint, but just overall as clean as possible so we, we don't have as much coming in again. And then a lot of people do need some help with um, – helping their immune systems to calm down and get back into balance. Uh, we need to look at things like, is there something going on in the sinuses or in the gut and get those back into balance. And then almost always we need to repair some cell membranes with things like phosphatidylcholine and the right amounts of the good fats. And then mitochondria get so injured by, um, by toxins in general, and especially the mycotoxins. So a lot of the things that actually help the mitochondria, the little organelles inside the cell that make energy, to help them to actually make energy better so the cells can work better. So things like, um, I love a particular CoQ10 called MitoQ that actually gets into the mitochondria really well. And um, then some uh, regular CoQ10, the magnesium, the B vitamins, the carnitine, and uh, just see what it is that that um, each person starts to notice that they feel better. So let's talk about some of the items in terms of the nutritional deficiencies. You've mentioned magnesium is one of them. What are some of the other core nutritional deficiencies that you put in place early on in a protocol? So I love, if I'm working with a patient, I love to get a profile called an ion profile or a NutriVal so I can really see more specifically. But uh, just in general, the, you know, the, the good fats. You've got to have good fat. A low fat diet to heal from mold is, and environmental toxins is not going to work because you need, you need cholesterol, you need fat to be able to do the repair of the cell membranes, uh, to uh, keep the brain going because the brain has such a high amount of fat and to make your hormones. So, uh, and then amino acids, those are the protein building blocks. So you have to make sure you're, you know, if you're vegan, vegetarian, it's very hard to recover as well. Um, and then um, the, and a lot of good antioxidants uh, in the diet and then also with supplementation can be uh, super helpful because the body's on fire. Um, and then the mitochondrial things end up being critical. I definitely agree on the fats. I think so many of us thought, you know, for many years, fats were bad and you should stay away. And this morning I've already had a, a, a tablespoon of balance oil, a tablespoon of chia seeds and a tablespoon of phosphatidylcholine. So I'm starting off the morning pretty, pretty loaded. <laughs> and I think you're helping to protect your cells and your body from the environmental exposures. I mean, it, right. those are just so important for having resiliency. Another thing that you focus on in your program is gastrointestinal health. So what are some of the tools you use there? Do you use Megaspore Biotic or the Restore product from Zach Bush? Any favorites? I love both of those. <laughs> I think the Megaspore has really been leading the way with, uh, with probiotics as far as um, actually shifting what's going on with the microbiome and making it more resilient to have a good distribution of, of um, the good the good fighters in there. Uh, and then the store really does a nice job with helping the mucosal lining to be better. Um, and then I, you know, just depending on um, the person and what the budget is and all that kind of thing, um, the things like uh, glutamine and the um, intestinal repair, uh, a lot of people actually do need uh, betaine, the stomach acid to to really start that uh, breakdown and digestion, the pancreatic enzymes. If, if somebody's having any type of bloating or gas, that's a really good sign that, that those are, are really critical. And then a lot of people that are being affected by mold are very uh, gluten and dairy intolerant. So you know, that's one of the most important things to, to get out are the, the inflammatory foods. And can't really even think of a patient that hasn't needed to be gluten and dairy free. 
Yeah, absolutely agree. We talked a bit about colonization of the sinuses and GI tract um, from water damage building exposure. What are some of the tools that you use to help deal with that colonization in terms of antifungal support? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like to test if I can, so I know what I'm treating. So there are a couple of nasal swabs that I'll do. Um, one by Microgen and one by Microbiology DX. That one's better at finding the the marcons and the bacterial things, and one is better at finding the fungal. Um, but a lot of people, just if we put them on a, a citrus spray, um, uh, we'll we'll notice an improvement in how their sinuses feel. Uh, the other thing that I found is pretty helpful is just the uh, the silver. Although I'm a little careful about blanketly recommending that. I think the citrus spray has a very low side effect profile and is great. Um, but, but for the more chronic, difficult, the uh, prescription colloidal silver, and then a lot of people actually do need to be on the nasal antifungals, either, um, you know, open the capsule, put it in a nail med wash or spray or even nebulized one of the um, key things that I've seen from kind of people tolerating treatment is, is really important is minimizing all sources of inflammation. So if we can reduce inflammation in the body, it seems like people tolerate their broader treatment protocol much better. What are some of the things that you like to do to help minimize inflammation while people move through your protocol? So the low inflammation diet, again, that's so important. If you're eating the inflammatory foods, that's going to be systemic. Uh, and a lot of people have hard time making that jump, but that's uh, very important. And then a lot of times there's the mast cell activation. So the things that uh, the low histamines, um, the histamine enzymes and things like quercetin and the other things that help to reduce the histamine response. And then um, I really like, there's a liposomal turmeric that's come out recently that I think does a really great, great job of culturing the fire. And then our spiritual can also be helpful. Is it a specific product for the liposomal turmeric and resveratrol? Um, the resveratrol, I've been using one by Thorn that actually okay. has um, the um, nicotinamide deriboside in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, um, the liposomal turmeric is from Pneumatica. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, the mast cell and histamine piece, I think, is a big player in inflammation. I think mold is probably one of the big triggers of mast cell activation. But I do think that a lot of these other environmental toxins that you've talked about, heavy metals, for example, I think sometimes when we aggressively are going after heavy metals and they're kind of being uh, more aggressively moved through the body, I think some of that um, activation can be from mast cell activation as well. Um, And so I agree, the low histamine diet, it seems like quite a number of people do really well with that and notice a lot of their overall symptoms really reduce or resolve. I mean, because with the mast cell, like it's like the whole body's kind of leaky. <laughs> the, the junctions that are supposed to be sealed up are kind of breezy. And uh, so that's really instrumental in getting them the body to be able to do everything else properly is, is to, to handle that piece of things. So the fermented foods, the aged foods <laughs> um, that are, you know, we think should be good for us, or it's just a temporary avoidance until things can kind of get healed up. Yeah, and interestingly, um, collagen even, I think I've read in some of your work. So what are your thoughts on supplemental collagen in those people that are dealing with mast cell activation? You know, it took me a while to figure this one out, honestly, because I, you know, I kept reading about bone broth and collagen, and that should be good for me. But every time that I would... <laughs> that I would start drinking bone broth, my gut would be a little bit more upset or my nose would be runnier because, you know, I just usually don't have those symptoms at all now. Um, And so finally I was like, okay, bone broth isn't good for me. The collagen is powders aren't good for me. I have found one that's made by um, orthomolecular that has a lower histidine component to it. So, you know, the distribution of the amino acids is a little different, and I seem to be able to do that occasionally, but not every day. 
Very good. So let's then talk a little about detoxification. You mentioned binders. What are some of your favorite binders? Do you find that the natural binders uh, for your patient population work as well as cholestyramine might for others? Yes, I feel like they actually work better for <laughs> for everybody because cholestyramine is a chemical. You know, it's like a plastic. Um, so I really try to avoid that. I have very few patients that we do that with. And, um, and then I like to use a combination of the binders. I find that that really seems to work the best because we're actually trying to eliminate a whole lot of different uh, chemicals at the same time. The mycotoxins, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. And we can only test for a few of them, but there was actually a bunch of them. So by having a little bit different chemical structure, I think we pull out um, more effectively if we combine some charcoal, some clay, and uh, the modified citrus pectin, I think do the best job when I can, you know, get the patients to do all three of those together. And then um, I, the glutathione is also a little bit tricky. You know, the most people I think have the best effect with the liposomal glutathione. You know, start really slow and then kind of gradually build up to whatever the sweet spot is. So, you know, some people kind of get to like a very small dose, a fourth of a teaspoon or half a teaspoon, and that's kind of where they do their best. And then other people, you know, are doing two or three teaspoons twice a day and uh, do better with the higher doses. So it's, it's definitely something that needs to be titrated. Very occasionally, very rarely, I find somebody does a little bit better with the acetyl uh, glutathione, but usually it's the liposomal that, that has the most effective treatment. And then I feel like most people need some type of liver support, either some NAC or milk thistle or one of the other traditional uh, liver support. And then um, if anybody has any signs of having some any gallbladder dysfunction, um, some bile acids, uh, or one of the gallbladder support, uh, supplements that really help to get that bile flow better. And then interestingly, the, uh, choline, phosphatidylcholine can also really help with the bile flow because you need that bile flow to really help the toxins get out through the intestinal tract. Any thoughts on sauna therapy or coffee enemas for supporting detoxification? Yeah, uh, you know, it's really interesting. <laughs> When you recommend a coffee enema for somebody, they're like, you want me to do what? <laughs> but uh, And then they my... send you Christmas cards every year after they actually <laughs> do it because they feel so much better. <laughs> it's life-saving for some people. Like it is what finally gets their, you know, their spigots open so that then their body can actually get rid of some of the toxins. So when people will do it with low mycotoxin coffee, <laughs> um, it can really, really... Um, make a difference uh, to, to do that. And then sauna, um, the thing about the sauna is I find that sometimes people will get in there and they'll be like, okay, I have to stay in here for 30 minutes and I can't get out until I'm you know, drenched in sweat. But there really are some subtle warning signs from the body that today I can only do five minutes. So if you override your instinct to, okay, I'm done, it's just time to get out or take a break, you can make yourself very sick with the sauna. Um, and this uh, same kind of thing with the hyperbaric. Um, I've had some patients that um, the hyperbaric was even as good or better than what you're describing with the, um, the coffee enemas. It, it, there's something about it that really, I think, supercharges the mitochondria and hyperoxygenates, and and it's like finally lets the body kick into gear to be able to heal itself. Um, so if people have access to a hyperbaric chamber and they don't have a lot of sinus or ear issues going on uh, that could be traumatized by the the hyperbaric, I think that's also something that can really speed along the progress. One of the things with saunas that I don't think most people realize is, yes, we sweat things out, but at the same time, those 
uh, far infrared rays can mobilize toxins within us. And so if we don't have the amunctories open, we don't have binders on board, we don't have drainage remedies, liver, kidney, lymph, matrix, all of those things, um, we potentially are redistributing toxins in the body that might then land in a place where it creates more problems for us than where they were before. So I do think they can be great, but I also think that they're definitely something to discuss with the practitioner to say, am I doing all the right things kind of pre prerequisites for being able to benefit from and not create other problems with sauna therapy. Exactly. What about methylation support? You mentioned it briefly. Um, can methylation support be done too aggressively at the wrong time? Can that in some cases make things worse? I know some people um, suggest that when methylation is, is slowed or reduced, that in some cases that might actually be an intelligent adaptation of the body um, and not something that we need to necessarily be really forceful about trying to support. What's your experience? Been? Yeah, it's... Um so I think about it as uh, methylation is like cog wheels, right? The, they're wheels that um, everything kind of has to line up for it to, to spin properly. So if you get one part of it spinning too quickly, you can actually really create havoc. Um, so with patients, I actually test their methylation pathways to the you know, important places on that cog wheel to to make sure that we've done that right balance that we haven't, you know, spun things out of control in one process or another. So um, it is something to be, to proceed with caution. However, I have found that it's, it can be a very important piece of getting better. Mm -hmm. If you're not methylating, it's very hard to repair DNA and to actually detoxify and clear things out. So a lot of times it is an important part of why people got sick in the first place, why they've been the canary in the coal mine and, um, and the, and the path to getting well and staying well. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a tricky area to just say, okay, everybody needs to take X, Y, Z supplement for methylation and it's the right dose. It, I would definitely proceed with caution because you can potentially do more harm if you take it too fast and don't have the right balance of things. One of the most common complaints that I'm sure you hear in your patients is fatigue. You talked about supporting the mitochondria. Do you find that when you support the mitochondria with things like MitoQ and carnitine and some of the other tools that you mentioned, do you find that that often helps their energy levels or is that often not enough to really make a big shift there? It depends on how, how poisoned their mitochondria are. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, if it, if it does really hard, help to start to kick the a ATP production into place, I do think they like, okay, I can feel things are improving. And then other times, you know, it's a longer haul. You know, we've got to really get the toxin levels down and the mitochondria rebuilt before they notice a change in the energy. But sometimes it really is like a magical time frame, and somebody's like, oh, okay, I can feel some momentum. I'm getting some energy back. I'm noticing some improvement. Let's talk then about brain fog, which is another really common <sighs> symptom. So what are the common things that you think about as the top contributors to brain fog and then some of the tools that are helpful for supporting cognitive function? Yeah, that actually is such a common symptom. And I think part of it is you know, the olfactory nerve, you know, where we're smelling, um, breathing, has a direct access into the brain. So I think that the, the toxins are actually, and sometimes even the infections are, are going right in. So um, the, all the brain rebuilding things can really make a difference. Uh, in addition to, you know, getting that toxin load down out of the brain. So um, phosphatidylcholine, enough fat, all the mitochondrial support um, are critical. And a lot of times if, when we do either IV or oral phosphatidylcholine, people can start to feel their brain coming back online and, uh, and also feel more emotionally stable. Um, I also sometimes if the, the um, neuropsychiatric symptoms are severe, we'll do the IV phosphatidylcholine and the IV uh, NAD 
um, to really give the brain a jump start. But usually we can just do it orally, you know, high doses of the phosphatidylcholine and that mitochondrial support at the same time that we're that we're detoxifying. So it's really interesting, the research that's come out on the glymph system. So that's the lymphatic system in the brain. And um, one of the things I love about that research is how important sleep is for the, for the glymph system to actually get to work on, on um, clearing out the toxins. So really prioritizing the sleep and making sure that, um, that people are sleeping well. So, and um, try not to use the drugs with, um, you know, the benzodiazepines and that kind of thing for, for sleep, but using the more natural things like um, magnesium, uh, melatonin, um, uh, glycine, the, the things that help with GABA and even CBD to, to, to work with getting the good sleep. And then all, of course, all this uh, sleep hygiene things, but that's actually one of the things that I found often is disrupted when people are being affected by mold and it's, it, you know, it's, it just makes it like pushing a boulder up the hill to, to get better if, the, if we don't get that sleep happening. Yeah. Another, another big reason that glycine potentially plays a fairly large role in these kinds of environmental toxicity protocols, right? We talked about it earlier from the perspective of helping with maybe glyphosate and other environmental toxins, but also from a sleep perspective, it's reminding me that I need to go and get it back in my routine. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, a, it's so inexpensive and so helpful. It's just a no brainer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, numbness, tingling, paresthesias, those types of things that maybe can be associated to myelin. Are there specific things that you might do to support the myelin and, and healthy nervous system when people have some of those types of symptoms? Yeah, and those are actually quite common. Um, people often have that paresthesia, neurological tingling, electrical feeling in their body somewhere. Um, so it's interesting because a lot of the things that also help the brain, nervous system tissue, help the periphery. So the, um, the phosphatidylcholine, the good fats, the mitochondrial support um, can really, really make a difference. But the biggest thing with that, I think, is getting the toxin level down because I think so much of the neurological symptom is the direct injury of the toxin. Perfect. I noticed in your protocol, one of the things that you leave towards the end is really this balancing of the hormones. And so my thought process all along has kind of been that when we have this dysregulation of the immune system and, and just the body in general from toxicity and infections and so on, that as we remove those things from the body, the hormonal and endocrine system can start to regain balance. And then maybe the support they need is a little more specific. Is, is that why that's more towards the end of your protocol versus something you do right up at the front? Or Yeah. And a lot of times just as we're doing the work, the hormones will get more balanced. So yeah. rather than to kind of mess with the wisdom of the body, like you said, like there's some things that are upregulated and downregulated probably as a protective mechanism. Um, so I prefer not to give hormones and major hormonal support if I don't need to and let the body self-adjust and self-correct. Yeah, very good. Hair loss is a common thing that people um, will ask about. What are your thoughts on the different reasons we might see hair loss? You know, I think it's kind of one of those things like um, when people's bodies are really stressed, they don't produce babies. Like if you're, you know, in a famine, then, you know, the body's wise enough to downregulate the hormones so that you're infertile um, because you don't have the resources to, to build a healthy baby. And I think hair is one of those things. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like it's super important. And I think when I have been really sick in the past and I've lost my hair, I felt like when my hair was falling out and I was dying. <laughs> but um, uh, I think it's just like it's the body's resources are going to other things other than making hair. And uh, so then when it starts coming back, it's a sign that the things are robust and healthier again. So, um, but there are some supplements that I love for, um, for helping with that. We, um, one's called collagen restore and another one's called collagen pro. And I've noticed myself when I take those things and also with patients that it kind of gives the body those extra resources to, to grow hair again. 
Fantastic. But um, I've had so many patients over the years that um, the hair was definitely, hair loss was a sign that there was environmental toxin exposure. How about hypercoagulation? How common do you see thickened blood or hypercoagulation in patients? And what do you think are the triggers for that hypercoagulopathy? Yeah, that's a tricky one because it can be um, an autoimmune issue. Um, and, and then also, I think also a direct toxin exposure. Um, it's one of those things that, um, you know, can be deadly if you, if you have a hypercoagulant coagulation issue so you know running coagulation panels where you're looking for a lot of different things as well as the von willow brands uh signs um there's also issues with the, the opposite extreme where you know you have easy bruising and that kind of thing is another uh sign when i hear that i think toxin and a lot of times mold so um yeah, when that's occurring, it's really important to manage that with things like fish oil or natokinase, aspirin, or even sometimes the anti medication anticoagulants. Like heparin or Lovenox or something along those lines, yeah. Let's talk a little bit as we wrap up about stress management, about meditation and tools that you use to help shift us to more of a parasympathetic healing state. And then related to that, but a little different, do you incorporate tools in your practice that are used to retrain or reboot the limbic system? And how might those be helpful in your patient population? Yeah, I have some personal experience with that. I, uh, the last time I got exposed to a really uh, bad mold about two years ago, I, um, I was at a conference and I was really interested in neurofeedback but hadn't really looked into it that in that much detail. So I sat down at the neurofeedback machine for a good 10, 15 minutes. And when I got, when I got done, the woman administering the test was like, Oh my God, Dr. Shippey, what's, <laughs> what's happened to you? <laughs> so, okay, I guess I better take a look at this. And then I went to another conference a couple of weeks later and I learned about, um, they were doing a review on the, like the handheld kind of portable medical devices. And I learned about the muse. Uh, so the Muse is a little uh, headband that sends your brain waves to an app on your phone and then tells you kind of where you are in that. Are you running from the tiger versus are you chill? And um, it, when I first started it, I couldn't even get into the relaxed state and no birds chirp that, you know, inform you <laughs> that you are in a rela really relaxed state. And so rather than spending the 30 grand on a neurofeedback machine to have in my office, like I had thought about, or, you know, spending a hundred, hundred fifty dollars a couple times a week to go to neurofeedback training, I thought, okay, I'm going to give this a try. And it was remarkable how uh, all I had to do is focus on my breathing 20 minutes every morning. And within weeks to months, I was actually able to uh, get, so I would just stay in the calm, um, at a period for 20 minutes and have lots of birds chirping at me, letting me know I was relaxed. So the contrast to how I felt in my body when I was stuck in the limbic state to how I feel now, <laughs> where I can, you know, I can go into the stress state if I'm, you know, worried about my kids or, you know, I'm stressed about a patient or something in my office, but I, my body can remember mm -hmm. how to go into that relaxed state. So, so now after having done that brain training, my body's more resilient because you, your body's not going to go do repair when you're stuck or when you're spending all your time in the run from the tiger state. It's going to just be in that go run. Um, you need to have the meditation relaxation time. So that's what really worked for me. And I've had a lot of patients do it now and help them to get more in that restorative state. But um, uh, Annie Hopper has the her system, which I've had some patients do as well, that has been very helpful. And then um, I think meditation yoga is also very helpful. It, I'm a long-term meditator. I've meditated, you know, explored about 20 different types of <laughs> meditation because I uh, find it fascinating, but it didn't help me get out of that really severe limbic state that I was in. So, you know, you know at this point in time, now that I'm not stuck there, the meditation's very effective. But for where I was back then, I really needed something with the neurofeedback in it to help 
trigger my brain to be able to relax again. Beautiful. The last question is one that I ask of every guest, and that is, what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Oh, that's such a great question. Uh, there's some things that I do daily and some things that I do weekly. That's okay, yeah. So for me, because I know I have this risk of uh, getting the environmental exposures again, I do try to do um, a sauna once or twice a week, get into the hyperbaric a few times a month. Um, I take a daily phosphatidylcholine and mitochondrial support and glutathione. Uh, I feel like because my brain is so precious to me, <laughs> you know, I really need it to work great every day, that the more resiliency that I can have with my brain, that that then really helps the rest of my body as well and to keep the toxin levels low. And then a meticulous diet. Like I, I really see how what I eat informs my biochemistry and physiology. I need to avoid the toxins and put lots of good phytonutrients in to run everything well. I know that you're putting lots of good information out. If people want to learn more about you, if they're interested in potentially working with you as a practitioner, how do they find you? It's just anshippymd.com. And we do have a mold handout. It's just anshippymd.com slash mold to get some of the, um, you know, some of the basics that we covered today with testing and that kind of thing. And are you taking new patients? I am. Okay, beautiful. This has been super fun. This whole topic of mold illness, um, detoxification, uh, just resonates with me so much. It's really the area that we need to focus on for people with these chronic, complex illnesses to really get better, to get their lives back. And so, you know, I think it's uh, fantastic that people like you are really digging into this and providing new solutions and new tools. And so I just really honor you for the work that you're doing. It's so important and just appreciate everything that you're doing and all the information that you shared with us today. So thank you so much, Dr. Shippey. Thanks for having me. And I just want everybody to know that the bo their body's capacity to heal is extraordinary. And when it has what it needs and it's not being overburdened, amazing things can happen. Awesome. Thank you so much. To learn more about today's guest, visit AnnShippyMD.com. That's AnnShippy, S-H-I-P-P-Y, M-D.com. AnnShippyMD.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.